We made a decision to each other and a commitment that divorce was not an option for us, no matter what. It's just not an option. It's not an option to, to throw in the towel. And there was a few times that I was going to give up and I honestly, because at that time we didn't have Christ in our marriage and I don't know what kept me there, honestly, like it was just this tug that I was supposed to be with this person. To throw it all away just seems uh, like a poor decision. Who am I to say, well, things aren't going so great now I walk? You know, if, if, I, if we're going to be together, we're going to be together in the good times and the bad times. That's just the way it's going to be. We have, we have no doubt that we're going to make it till we're old and have canes and wrinkles and yep. hemorrhoids. Yep. <laughs> you need to find something every single day in the other person that you, a positive thing that you can say about that person. Because when all you do is focus on all the negative things in your relationship, you're gonna be down that road of destruction. We made a willful choice. You know, we were gonna get through this and, and um, stayed faithful to God. And sometimes when we weren't so faithful to God, He was still so faithful to us. And God didn't give up on us. I, at, at no point, we, you stood in front of God and you made a vow. And, and God made a vow to, to each and every one of us. And, and He's been faithful. Um, we owe Him at least that to, to, to stick it out because all things are, are possible through Christ. Um, it may feel like you can't do it, you probably can't, but, but He can. When I look into your eyes It's like watching the night sky Or a beautiful sunrise There's so much they hold And just like them old stars I see that you've come so far to be right where you are How old is your soul? Well, I won't give up on us Even if the skies get rough I'm giving you all my love I'm still looking up when you're needing your space To do some navigating I'll be here patiently waiting To see what you find Cause even the stars they burn Some even fall to the earth We got a lot to learn God knows we're worth it No, I won't give up I don't want to be someone who walks away so easily I'm here to stay and make the difference that I can make A difference they do a lot to teach us how to use the tools and gifts we got Yeah, we got a lot at stake and in the end, you're still my friend. At least we did intend for us to work. We didn't break, we didn't burn. We had to learn how to bend without the world caving in. I had to learn what I got, what I'm not, who I am. I won't give up on us, even if the skies get rough. I'm giving you all. I'm tough, he knows we got a lot to learn, God knows we're worth it, I won't give up on us, 
even if the skies get rough I'm giving you all my love Still looking up Hey, we're in the last week of our series called From This Day Forward And we're going to jump into today And we're going to jump into God's Word If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 19 Matthew chapter 19 And we're going to be looking at verses 1, 1 through 8 in just a moment. But before we do, I want to take a, a moment just to review where we've been in this series. Uh, I hope that um, those of you that are married, that, that some things that you've learned during this series have just been an encouragement or are helping you to take steps forward. For those of you that are single, I hope it's given you some things to think about um, for the opportunity or if God leads you to a point of marriage. And, and for those of you that have maybe already been through divorce, um, that I hope that today is going to be a time that you can still find encouragement through, through Christ. And so I want us to begin today like we have each week by just uh, reading together our commitment. So if you would, could we just all participate from this day forward? I commit to seek God, fight fair, have fun, stay pure, and never give up. I began week one by reading what are some common commitments that, that people make whenever they are uh, going through their wedding. And so I'll just remind you of that. It says, I, Eric, take you, Amy, to be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love, to cherish from this day forward as long as we both shall live. That, that last phrase is really what we're talking about today. That, that whole vow is really a very biblical vow because it realizes something. It realizes that when you put two sinners in a relationship, that there's going to be for better and also for what? For worse. Um, and also, uh, most of us could testify that there's also times of richer and poorer. Uh, and, and, you know, sometimes it, it's, you may, maybe it started out richer and poorer, or maybe it started out poorer, maybe it's just stayed poorer. I don't know what it is. But you know that, that that's a huge commitment to love, to cherish in sickness and in health, because we're not always going to be as, as in great of shape as when we meet each other. And then the very end of that statement is, until death do us part. The only way we're going to end this is if death comes. But if you really think about it, in many ways in our culture, we've started approaching um, marriage in a very different way. Instead of seeing it as something that we never give up on, I, I think that this would be more, if we were honest, how most people would speak their vows. So here would be our current way that we approach vows. I take you to be my wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, well, as long as there are more better days than worse days. And as long as we have more money rather than less money. And as long as you're still as fit as when we first met. From this day forward, as long as we still both feel like being together. Now, I would think that would be the worst wedding ever if somebody ever read those as their vows. I mean, I think you should just go ahead and say, all right, we shouldn't even do this thing if that's your approach. But the truth is we, we've really moved away from this idea of a strong commitment uh, of God's intention of relationships staying together. And so today what I want to do is I want us to, to look at God's intention for marriages and how they were meant to stay together and then um, and, and offer one some encouragement to those of you that are married that you will actually embrace this this commitment to say no matter what comes our way we're going to stick it out we're never going to give up we're going to keep working we're going to rely on Christ and we're going to keep pushing forward for those of you that are single I hope that what it will do is that if you are thinking about marriage or that's ever a consideration that you'll realize how serious of a thing that you're stepping into you're not just making I mean it's not like you're you're renting a car that you can try out for a while and then send it away there's something much deeper that's happening and so I hope the seriousness of, of marriage and and if you're about to take that step that you'll go into it with the full knowledge of what you're really committing to and then last for those of you that you've already seen your marriage fall apart maybe you already have given up and I hope that 
the encouragement that you hear today is that even though that's happened in your life, that God doesn't give up on you, that that's not the unpardonable sin, um, that God still gives grace, that even if your relationship is, uh, has fallen apart in the past, that it's an opportunity from this day forward to begin making changes. And so let's pray before we jump into God's word. Hopefully you made it to uh, Matthew chapter 19. And let's pray and just ask for, for his help as we study. Father, we pray this morning as we study your word, we believe that every word of it is true. We believe that it changes us. We believe that, uh, that we need to hear from you. Thank you for speaking to us through your scripture as we prepare to, to just uh, approach these words of Jesus. I pray that you will um, apply them by the power of your Holy Spirit to each of us in just the way that we need to hear it. God, help me to be able to preach with uh, a clarity and a boldness that, that comes from you. We pray all this in your mighty name. Amen. Matthew chapter 19, and we're going to begin by reading the, the first three verses together. It says this, When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went into the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. And large crowds follow, followed him, and he healed them there. Verse 3, Some Pharisees came to him to test him, and they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Now we'll stop right there before we get into how Jesus um, responds to this, this question. At this point, the, the Pharisees were looking for any way that they could trip Jesus up. They were looking for a way for him to uh, incriminate himself, to, that he, they could get the crowds against Jesus. And so they choose to bring what? was for them a very hot topic. You know, there's some things that just don't change, do they? So the idea of divorce and questions regarding divorce is not just something that we approach. We're not the first people, the first culture to, to have to deal with it, but they bring up this question of divorce to Jesus. And so they simply, they, they ask Jesus, you know, can a man uh, divorce his uh, wife for any reason? Now, a little background to this is the Jews used to, they were like kind of two schools of thought. Um, based on this, this one verse in, in Deuteronomy, they used to debate and they'd say, what does that mean that a man can put his, his wife away if she displeases him? And there was one group that said, they, that they said displeased, that means that it doesn't matter what she does, you can divorce her for any reason. You didn't like how she made your food, she cooked you eggs that were runny. Y'all were there a while back, you, you know that. You know, you don't like how she looks that day. I don't know. You could just, you could say, well, she displeases me. See you later. Send you off. That was how some people in the culture approached, where you basically could divorce people for any and every reason. Well, then there was another school of thought that says, no, that's not really what it's about. There's only a, a, a really one circumstance. And they said that would be if adultery happens because back in that culture, when adultery happened, it was, uh, had a death penalty that was attached to it. Man, aren't we really glad that that's not the case for us right now by God's grace? So there were these two schools of thought. And so they're like, all right, we're going to get Jesus tripped up. We're going to get him in on this debate. That way he can get divided and we can, we can tear him down from this. But Jesus does something that is classic Jesus. Jesus says, I'm not going to answer your question in the way that you want me to. I'm going to actually point you to something that's much deeper, much better. So they were coming. They really didn't care about Jesus' answer for divorce. All they wanted to do is trip Jesus up, but Jesus is about to teach them and teach us something that is so important. And so what Jesus does is he says, you know what, I'm not going to focus on divorce. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning, and we're going to focus on before divorce was even in the picture, what was God's intention for marriage? And often that's what we need to do is we go back to the beginning. We began this year by a series called Origins, answering life's biggest questions. We went back to the beginning because the beginning is where we see how God created everything to be. It's his intention. And so let's look at Jesus' answer, and he's going to show us what God's original design for marriage truly was. Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6. Jesus says, Haven't you read... 
which by the way, to the Pharisees, this would have been kind of insulting because they read the Bible all the time. They, they were all the time in the Old Testament. It's like Jesus is like, are you serious? You don't know this? What's up, guys? You're supposed to be spiritual leaders. So he says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So Jesus goes all the way back to Genesis, Genesis chapter one, Genesis chapter two. He says, we're not even talking about the divorce. That's part of the brokenness. Here's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about God's intention for marriage. So I wanna just walk through a couple of the phrases that we just looked at so that we can have a deeper understanding of what God's intention is. I I believe that we can't have the best marriages that God has called us to until we actually understand what marriage is all about. We don't know how to best encourage others. Even if you're not married, how do you encourage other people that are thinking about marriage or pursuing marriage or going through a difficult marriage? One of the best things we could do is to take people back to God's word and say, here's God's heart behind giving us marriage. So he begins by saying he made them male and female. How many of you, show of hands, know that men and women are different? How many of you actually actually know this, okay? Um, We're different. Um, Have you ever noticed that a lot of times when you see married couples that that they're often opposites in many ways? Um, My wife and I talk about this. We're very opposite in, in so many ways. I don't even have time to get into it, but we're not only opposite because, you know, I'm a man, she's a woman. There's obvious differences that I don't need to go into, but then there's other differences that are there by design. God created men and women different. And the problem is that because of sin, what often opposites attract, but then after a while, opposites begin to attack, right? So the things you initially loved about each other um, can start to cause conflict, but that's not how, there's no conflict in the beginning. He created male and female. And the idea is that the man and the wife complement each other. God made us different by design. And, and so that's just part of how he, how he wanted us to be. Well, notice the next thing it said in this verse, it says that this man will leave his, his father and his mother. We're celebrating Mother's Day today. And the truth is parenting is not about um, us raising up our kids so that we can keep them. It's about raising up kids so that we can send them out into the world. And so marriage is all about starting new families. It's about launching out into the world. And so God created for men men and women to be married, to lead their father and mother. And then it says the two will become what? One flesh. Now, some of you may be thinking, what, what in the world does that mean? I mean, we're like sitting beside each other. We're not like a blob. We're not like Siamese twins together or anything. So what does it mean whenever we actually talk about that a man and a woman become one flesh? Well, here's the reality that before you become married, you each are living independent lives, aren't you? You're you're going one way, they're going another way. Part of what it means when we come into marriage, one flesh, means that we stop living individualistically. We stop living to ourselves and for ourselves, and now we start partnering together. We do life together. That means that we're together uh, spiritually. We're seeking God together, back to our first commitment. We're together financially. We're together mentally. We're together physically. We're together in, in so many ways. What God has joined together so that we can navigate life together. And the very last phrase is really the key of where we're going to jump off of today. It says, what God has joined together, let no one separate. See, one of the myths that we have started to believe is that marriages are put together by our society. It's not our society that joins people together. It's not the fact that you had a justice of the peace or the fact that someone, you signed a piece of paper. Now, let me just say that if you want to be legally married, you do have to do that. But besides that, ultimately, it's not our society that that joins marriages together. It's ultimately God that joins marriages together. It's God who unites a man and a woman together in holy matrimony in a one flesh union until death would do them part. So here's the big idea that I want us to see today, and we're going to talk about practically how we can pursue it. 
So this is, this is our commitment. From this day forward, we commit to everybody say this, never give up. So from this day forward, we commit to never give up. And now I'm going to give you the reason why we should never give up. Because we should not unwind what God has made one. Now that's a weird way to say it. But the idea is God's made us one flesh. And if God has united us together in one flesh, we should not unwind what God has made one. Now think about this. We don't need a lot of discussion to know that in our society that when you become unwon, that there's a ripping and a tearing and turmoil that happens because of that. I mean, all of us in some way have been affected by, by divorce, by seeing relationships tear apart, whether it was our parents, whether it was ours, whether it was our children's. Well, we, we've seen how divorce can just rip apart, but the idea today, what we want to see is that God wants us to commit to never give up. That even when, when things get rough, even when the days are difficult, even when it's not everything that you pictured when you were planning your wedding when you were 12 years old or however old you were and I think that's more of a female thing guys are like throwing sticks and stuff but we often have a picture of what our marriage is going to be and sometimes when it doesn't turn out what we hope it's going to be we say I'm going to just leave I'm done I, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing so today what I want us to continue to do is let's finish up the story of Jesus so Jesus just kind of it doesn't answer their question really he says well God's intention is that, that that doesn't even happen God's intention I'm not entering into your de, your debate about divorce well then the Pharisees again still trying to trick Jesus let's listen to what they say Matthew chapter 19 verse 7 says why then they asked did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away well they have a legitimate question they're like well, if God didn't, if this wasn't a part of it, you're going back to the beginning. Why is it that, why did God give us this instruction? Jesus answered, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were, what? Hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. We don't really have time to go into why God gave this particular command, but a big part of this was per, to protect, even to protect the wife. Because often what was happening in this society is, is these men, they were getting tired of their wives and they were just putting them out without divorcing them. And they lived in a society where they could go marry somebody else. Well, the man would go off and marry somebody else. And now this woman was kind of left out here, isolated and alone, unable to remarry. And so Jesus through, uh, through Moses gives this command to say, you know what, you need to give a certificate of divorce so there can be a break and so that both of you can go on. But that was not ever God's intention. God did this. The reason he gave this command is because your hearts were hard. Now we often talk about God designed marriage, but God did not design divorce. God created marriage, he didn't create divorce. Divorce began to happen because his creation began to fall apart. And I want us to focus on this one phrase that Jesus says, because your hearts were hard. Do you know that so often that, that the reason that marriages begin to fall apart is because our hearts begin to get hard toward one another. Our hearts begin to get hard because we were, we were hurt by something the other person said, something they did, just a pattern that's existed within that relationship. And so what I want to do for, for our last moments together is I want to walk us through three components that I believe that if we will pursue them, they will help keep our hearts soft toward one another. Now, I know that some of you, that you're sitting in this room right now, and your heart might already be hard to your marriage, to your relationship. You might have came in here today on the verge of just saying, we're done. Uh, it, it's over. My prayer for you today is that, that, that God would begin to, to soften your heart in bringing hope and, and peace and restoration to, you, to your relationship. And... For those of you that are, that are not there, your hearts haven't become hard. Can I tell you, if we'll pursue these things, it's kind of hard for a hard heart to beat, isn't it? 
A hard heart doesn't beat with love. It doesn't beat with joy. It doesn't uh, beat with just uh, a hope in what God could do. But I believe that God can, again, can soften our hearts. And so that's what we're going to ask him to do. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write down three things that, that we could do that, to pursue to help our hearts to be softened. Number one, faith enables me. Faith enables me to never give up. In the video that began, somebody quoted and they said, you know, we couldn't do this without Christ. And that's where we began this series by saying that God has to be our one and our spouse has to be our two. And here's the truth that your your marriage is not going to be able to, to function in the way that God attended if he's not in the equation. So do you have faith in Christ that he can do something in your marriage that he can reverse what started to be broken because faith is believing things that we don't always see. Faith is always focused on, on an object and our faith is in Jesus and who he is. My faith and your faith for our marriages to be able to, to never give up, our faith can't be in our spouse because we've learned, are we gonna mess up? Are we gonna fall short? My faith can't even be in me because I mess up and I fail. And so we have to find a greater place to put our faith. And and so our hearts can become hard when we are putting our faith in the other person. When we're putting our faith, I'm I'm putting my faith in you that you're going to start doing everything right. It's not going to happen. But our faith instead is in Jesus Christ. Philippians 4.13 says this. I am able to do What's it say? All things through him who strengthens me. There's a song we sing here sometimes that says, I may be weak, but your spirit strong in me. My flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. This passage says that I could do all things through Christ who gives me strength. The focus of this is, Do you think God wants our marriages and our relationships to succeed based on his word? Do you think he wants us to never give up? Was that his intention from the very beginning? And so do you think that God is able to enable us, to strengthen us, to keep moving forward and to never give up? And I'm telling you today that it will not happen unless you have faith in him. You have to say, God, I can't do this on my own. And so some of you, uh, let's be honest, the reason a lot of relationships have fallen apart in the past is because Christ wasn't in the equation. We weren't leaning into the strength that only he can provide. But today, Christ says, hey, come to me. Come to me if you're weary. Come to me if you're worn out about your relationship and I'm gonna be your strength. It's it's partly maybe today the very thing that you need to do is say, God, I've been trying to do this on my own. I put my faith in the wrong places. Today I'm putting my faith in you that it's gonna only happen. We can only make it if you're in the equation. We can only make it if you're the one that's given us strength. So faith enables me. Let faith enable you today and soften your hearts that you'll never give up. Number two. Hope encourages me to never give up. How many of you have heard the statistic that 50% of marriages end in divorce? Raise up your hand if you've ever heard that before. Well, if you're here the very first week, you heard me because I said that. And, I, and if you remember, I told you that statistic is actually wrong. Um, there, if you're interested in the research for that or where I get that, then ask me after the service. But the truth is that the, the divorce rate's never been even close to 50%. And so often what people begin to think is, man, if only half the people make it, we're like flipping a coin. And that can be so discouraging. You think, man, if they can't make it, then I can't make it. Some of you that have already gone through a divorce before, you're like, well, man, I must be like doubly cursed then because I didn't make it. And if now I'm in a relationship now, how's that going to make it? And, and, and actually discouragement can be one of the biggest factors while we give up on a relationship, believing that things can't change. Can I tell you, our, our marriages, our relationships need an infusion of hope in them. We need an infusion of believing that God can do something even we think that, that, that it's all done. And so hope encourages me. I want to point us to a place of hope. Galatians 6, 9 says this. It says, let us not become weary in doing good. Did y'all know pursuing your marriage 
Did you know that pursuing having fun and learning to fight fair and staying pure, that, that those are all good pursuits, seeking God first? But the truth is, we can get weary in doing those things. Some of y'all might say, I'm already weary of doing some of these things. I'm already weary of, of trying to fight fair. I'm already weary of seeking after God. Can I tell you, don't get weary. Don't get weary in doing good. And here, become, here comes the promise. Here comes the hope. It says, for at the proper time, we will, what's it say? Reap a harvest. I want to say that again. We will reap a harvest. Now circle this, this word, because this is huge. If we do not give up. If we do not give up. See, God's promise to us is, is conditioned on the fact that we don't give up, that we don't stop doing the things that we need to do. And so it, don't just think that just a couple of tries of pursuing God in these five commitments of seeking God and fighting fair and having fun and staying pure and never giving up, that it's not just something you can try for just a little bit, it's something you have to keep after. And the promise of God's word is this, if you'll keep pursuing these things, you'll reap a harvest. You'll, you'll reap where you sow. And here's the truth. Some of us probably need to confess that we haven't really been, we haven't really been sowing into our marriage like we should. You ever heard the phrase, the grass looks greener on the other side? Well, the truth about that is, is the reason the grass is greener is because somebody pooped in the yard over there. <laughs> Here, here's what I'm saying. Every yard has holes in it. Every yard has mess in it. When you look at somebody else's relationship, you look somewhere else and you think, man, if I, just, if I didn't have this spouse, if I didn't have this relationship, if I had a relationship like them, then things would be perfect. The grass looks greener, but every yard is messed up. So here's the truth. We need to start watering our own grass. We need to start investing in our own marriage and then we can have hope. Let us not grow weary in doing good for at a proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Some of you, that's just what you need to walk away. You need to say, God, I'm not gonna give up. I wanted to give up, but God, I'm not going to because I believe your promise that if I'll keep pursuing that you'll bring a change. If, for those of you that like statistics, they found, um, they did a survey of, uh, they were following about a thousand couples um, over a five-year span, and they had asked him a question on a scale of one to five, one being, I absolutely love my marriage, it's wonderful, um, and then the lowest being, I, I wish I'm not even married, that scale. Well, they took um, independently each of these couples, and those couples that were on the lower scale, that they weren't very pleased with their marriage, here's what they found. They found that those couples that chose to stay together over the next four years, that Almost without exception, they move from being, I'm very unhappy with my marriage, to I'm very satisfied with my marriage. Four years. It's not going to happen overnight. But if we keep pursuing what God says, then we will reap what God says that we'll reap. Here's the third one and the last one. And, and I, don't, I don't think any of these are more important than the other. We've got to have faith in Christ, asking him to do things in our, in our marriage and in us. And we have to have hope that, that God's promise is, is true if we won't give up. But here's the third point, that we need love. Love guides me to never give up. Love guides me to never give up. We're about to read 1 Corinthians 13, which is probably one of the most read verses at, at weddings that you could think of. Now, the context actually isn't, doesn't have anything to do with marriage. The context actually has to do with spiritual gifts. But that doesn't negate the fact that it gives us a clear picture of what love really is. How many of you believe that it's possible that we have a wrong view of what love is? That we start to think that love is just about how we feel in the moment, that love is just simply an emotion. But can I tell you, love is all about a decision. Love is a decision that we, we choose to keep loving people. So I want us to read of how love can guide us, how love can soften our hearts. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 says this. It says, love is patient. How many of you need some patience in your marriage? You need some patience with, with yourself, patience with your spouse to continue pursuing, pursuing God. 
How many of you uh, need next when it says love is patient and love is what? It's kind. Sometimes we're just not kind. We're not kind with the things that we say. We're not kind with the things that we do. But when we let love guide us, we're going to let patience and kindness come along. It says love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. Just stop right there. How, how many of us just need to stop saying, God, you know, I want everything done the way I want it to be done? How many of us are ready just to say, I'm going to let love God, and it doesn't have to always be about me and demand my own way. It is not irritable. It does not keep a record of being wrong. Wow, how hard is that sometimes? Sometimes in our relationships, we have this catalog of all the things that have gone wrong and we keep them back there. But, but love calls us to forgive. Love calls us to not keep a record of that. Love calls us to embrace grace and give grace just like God has given it to us. It says, love, it does not rejoice about injustice, but it rejoices whenever the truth when I, wins out. Notice this, love, say it with me, never gives up. It never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. You see the connection of love? Love doesn't what? Love doesn't lose faith. Love doesn't lose hope. Love perseveres. Love keeps going. And so the most loving thing that that we could do is to not give up and say, God, no matter what comes, no matter what comes our way, God, we believe that we can make it through with you. Some of us need an infusion of love within our relationships. You need to just maybe in this moment that we're about to take, you just need to say, God, I just need you to soften my heart so I can begin loving like you called me to. Can we just all admit that none of us love like this fully? All of us can pick out some aspect of love that's in here and, and we can apply it to ourselves. Don't first apply it to your spouse and say, man, they really need to learn that. Begin by focusing in on yourself and saying, God, I want to love like you called me to love. God's intention has always been that our marriages make it. His intention is that we don't un-one what God has made one, that we never give up. So today, will you just embrace faith? Will you say, Christ, I need you? Will you embrace hope? God, I believe that things can be better. I do believe that we can reap a harvest. God, I embrace love. I'm going to let it guide how I respond to my spouse or to my future spouse. God, I'm going to do that today. Can we just bow our heads right in this moment? Just want to give you an opportunity right before the Lord to just pray and seek Him, to respond to, the, to God in the way that you need to. And we begin singing in just a moment. If you need to come and pray, we've got... We've got people waiting up at the front, part of our care team, that they're just here to pray with you about any and and, and everything, anything that you want to pray about. They're just here to to lend a hand, to lend an ear, to go to, to partner with you in prayer because Scripture says that when two or more are gathered in my name, I'm there in their midst. And so if that's a need, I, I encourage you to come and pray with someone. But right there in your seats, I wonder how many of you just need to say, we're not going to give up. We're not going to give up. We're going to keep pursuing Christ. We're going to keep making him our number one. And we're going to see him do above and beyond anything that we can even imagine. How many of you can't wait? Maybe you just need to imagine today of where your relationship can be five months down the road. Five days from now, five weeks, five months, five years. Where can you be? Let hope fill into you today. Don't let the devil tell you that it's just going to get worse and it's going to fall apart. You listen to the Lord, you listen to the Spirit tell you today to never give up. How many of us just need to let love flow in? Just need to confess, God, I haven't loved like you called me to love. So God, we just want to come before you right now in prayer. God, we confess that God, there's some people here that they've had relationships break up in the past, that their marriage has has ended. God, we confess that that's not what your desire is. 
But God, we also believe your promises and we embrace grace today that there's no sin that you can't cover. That God, that no matter how hard our hearts had gotten, that God, you can soften them today. So God, we embrace you. We ask that faith would fill up our hearts and hope would fill up our hearts and love would fill up our hearts and that our relationships would be changed. God, we give ourselves to you. God, we dedicate our lives to you today. God, if there are those in this place today that they've never given their heart to you first, God, I pray that before they worry about giving their heart fully open to their spouse, that they would give their heart to you, that they would embrace grace, that they would receive you as their Lord and Savior. And God, that you would come in and you would do a radical renovation within their lives and within their relationship. God, I pray over every marriage here today, God, I pray that we would make it, that God, that we would go past all the statistics that tell us that we're not gonna make it. And God, we would believe you and believe your word. Fill us up with your hope. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Hey, would you just stand to your feet this morning? I'm gonna just invite you. Maybe you'd like to come to the front and pray. Pray with your spouse, pray with a friend, pray over a marriage that you know of that, that's struggling right now on behalf of someone. This altar's open, we have people waiting and let's just worship together.